I think we've uh, finally addressed it now. Thanks for hanging there through our initial um, technical glitches, everybody. So I'm Ian Fittig. I'm the founder of Development Fix. I started uh, Film Lab as a personal project about seven years ago. And at the time, I thought it was going to be a simple little iOS app that would let people scan film using their mobile device. Um, at the time, we didn't have a lot of space. We didn't have room for a full scanning setup in the apartment that we were living at at the time. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to be able to just use your phone to scan film? So I started working on this project. And uh, little did I know that there was going to be so much to learn about uh, the history of film photography, color science, modern uh, computer graphics with GPUs and everything else that's gone to this project. But there's been a lot to learn, uh, and it's been uh, quite an educational experience for me. And as a company now, we've really learned a lot about the science of scanning film and how to get good results. So today we're going to share with you Film Lab 3, uh, the new version of Film Lab, and talk about uh, what's new, what's in it, why we are going in this direction, and a little bit about the future of film scanning as we see it. So thanks for joining us on YouTube. We already have some people in the chat. It's great to have you here. Uh, there should be a button to ask a question. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to post that. And uh, I've got Hannah sitting off screen. She's going to be watching your questions and making sure we, we answer them. So we'll get to those at the end. So to start, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the technology of scanning film, especially color film, which involves converting from a negative to a positive. Um, the, the going wisdom at the time when I started working on Film Lab was that this was a fairly easy thing to do. You'd see comments online where people would just refer to it as inverting a negative. So just flipping the colors and they'd say, well, just go into Photoshop, invert it, play with the curves tool a little bit until you get good results and uh, you've got your positive. And so I thought, well, this isn't going to be hard. But the reality is uh, scanning film is uh, a real art. And there's a lot of smart people who have worked on that problem over the years. The people who initially built film scanners when the transition from film to digital was happening, or when people started bringing their film to photo labs and expecting to get the results back digitally on a, on a CD at the time, and then later getting scans delivered over the internet. Um, and the people who developed those systems were really smart and had a deep understanding of the way film works and the color science of film, and also the way computer imaging works. Um, and then what happened was, as the industry transitioned away from film, as far as the medium that most people were using for their photography, um, a lot of that knowledge kind of got put to the side and forgotten. And a lot of the machines that are made for film scanning continue to be in service, but at this point, they're very, they're very out of date. So when I take my film to the photo lab, when you drop off your film to get it developed, um, they might be using a machine that was made 15 or 20 years ago. It might be attached to a computer running uh, Windows uh, 95 or some other old operating system. And that's, that's what they have to do for compatibility to keep these old systems that are working well working today. So as we started working on Film Lab, um, at first we thought, well, we're just going to build a little iOS app. And it's going to be easy because the color conversion won't be hard. And we're just going to take advantage of all the um, platform tools that Apple has, has put in to their software for working with images. So anytime you want to build image editing software, you have to deal with a lot of basic groundwork. You have to be able to load images in different files, like JPEGs and TIFFs. It gets more challenging if you're dealing with raw files because there's a ton of different varieties out there. Um, then you have to be able to actually process the image and run the algorithms you want to do. So even basic things like sharpening uh, require existing code or you have to write your own code. And then to create output, you have to do more work. And to display the image on screen, you have to do more work. And it gets even more challenging if you're dealing with video or anything real time where your code has to run really fast so that it can display live on screen. So of course, the approach we thought at the beginning is we're definitely not going to build our own platform from scratch. We're just going to use a mature platform like Apple and um, build on top of that. But as we got into developing the project and talked to people who were uh, potential users of Film Lab, we realized that there's really a need for better software, not just on Apple mobile devices, but for everybody. Um, people use Android devices. People need good film converting software that can run on their current desktops. Um, 
Mac OS and Windows and even Linux. And in the future, there's probably going to be need for film software that can run on specific devices that are designed for professional film scanning. And so realizing that, we realized that our software had to be cross-platform. It had to be able to run in any environment, and we couldn't rely on um, having Apple's photo framework to, to use or having Adobe's photo framework to use. We wanted to write standalone cross-platform software. So uh, it's a good thing we didn't realize how hard that was going to be because I probably would have never started uh, on the project. But seven and a half years later, here we are. We've built our own image uh, processing engine that's specifically designed for working with film. And that's what we currently have in our current release, Film Lab 2.5, which runs across desktop and, and mobile devices. And today we're introducing Film Lab 3. And Film Lab 3 is all about upgrading our image processing engine to something that's truly professional grade. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the backstory of, of how we got there before I dive into the demo. So as I started researching um, the, the color science of film and digital, by far the best resource I ever found was this book. And I'll recommend it to you if you ever want to do a real deep dive into the way that, uh, that film works and the way color science works um, in, in digital image processing too. It's called Digital Color Management. It's kind of a boring title, but um, it has really awesome information in it. So this is um, the resource that I use in developing a lot of our current um, Film Lab color processing engine. But for Film Lab 3, we really wanted to do something better. So we actually were able to get in touch with uh, one of the authors of this book, Thomas E. Madden, who's a very experienced image scientist. He has a, a long background of working with film and digital. Um, he worked with some uh, important industry people in the past. And um, he was able to come on board as a consultant and work with us over the last couple of years to develop our new uh, Film Lab color process that we're using in Film Lab 3. So we really started from the very basics. And the first question we had, um, just from a theoretical perspective, is, is it possible to do camera scanning and get really great results? When you send your film to a lab and they use a professional scanner, uh, the image sensor that's in that scanner is actually designed specifically for film. So the frequencies that it's targeting um, as it reads the information off the film is specific to the dyes that are on film. And the way that scanner works is actually very similar to the way chromogenic photo paper would have worked in the past. So originally, this whole process was designed to work with chemistry and light in a dark room. And, um, the chemistry on the paper was responsive to the same frequencies of light that matches up with the dyes on the film, and that helped it to get good color. So the problem that you run into when you try to do camera scanning, um, and I'll explain what that means. These days when people are scanning film, most of the time you're using a digital camera with a macro lens attached to it. And there's a lot of amazing advantages to that over a film, uh, a film scanner that would have been used in the past. With a camera, you can have a high resolution sensor. You get the full resolution of that sensor captured in real time. So uh, if you've ever done scanning with a flatbed scanner or a commercial film scanner, you know that if you choose to do a high resolution scan, you have to sit there for a long time while it slowly scans that image. Whereas when you're scanning with a camera, you just take, take a picture, uh, snap the shutter, the sensor records all the information, and now you have a negative. So um, there's been a lot of interest in using cameras for the future of film scanning. Uh, if you're joining as someone who scans your own film, that's probably what you do. But the problem with uh, camera sensors is that they're designed more to imitate the human eye and the way we see light and the sensitivities, uh, the spectral sensitivities of our eyes, not the spectral sensitivities of a film scanner or of, of chromogenic paper. So uh, working with Thomas Madden, we started with at the beginning to ask, can we mathematically model this so that we can get um, results using a digital camera for camera scanning that would be just as accurate as what you'd get with a film scanner? And uh, Tom did a lot of work on that for us, and we came back with proof that it is possible. You should be able to get great results um, using cameras for scanning. So that's good news for all of us that are already invested in camera scanning and view that as the future of film. And so from there, we started developing algorithms that would um, be able to, to properly take raw data that was captured with a modern digital camera, 
uh, understand the spectral characteristics of the specific sensor that, was, that it was captured with and translate that over um, into what we call film density, which is um, the, the amount of dye that would be on the original film. And from there, we can then process it and make a good looking output image out of it. So um, we've done that for, for Film Lab 3. And we've also uh, taken the chance to update our algorithm so that we now run on GPUs. So in a modern computer, you've got a, a regular processor, um, but you also have a GPU, a graphics processor. And modern computers and devices are just amazing in how powerful these graphics processors are. But you have to write custom code to get your, your image processing code to run on the GPU. We call that being hardware accelerated because it's using a specific hardware chip. And with Film Lab 3, um, all of our image processing code is now hardware accelerated. It runs super fast and it gives great results. So I'm going to start with a little demo and I want to show off some of the color science improvements. Lab 3, um, all of our image processing code is now hardware accelerated. It runs super fast. And... Sorry, a little more feedback, but I've I've got that right now. So I've got my inverted scans folder here. For some reason, my audio keeps unmuting and causing an echo, but so I think I've got it. And now, how about that? All right, hopefully that's our last batch of audio feedback, technical difficulties. So what I'm gonna do is just go through a few examples um, of the exact same file that has been converted with Film Lab 2.5 and Film Lab 3, and talk about um, some of the differences that you're going to see. So this file was made with Film Lab 2.5, and now let's transition. Here's the same scan made with Film Lab 3. Uh, I'll go back and run that again. That's the Film Lab 2.5 version, and this is the Film Lab 3 version. A couple specific things that I'm going to point out. Um, what you tended to see in Film Lab 2.5 when you were having trouble getting good color balance was that you're getting too much cyan in the output, especially in the highlights. So um, skin tones, the, the highlights on skin tones, skies would tend to skew cyan, which is the uh, opposite of red. So that's a problem with the, the red channel. And that actually comes from the differences between, um, between film dyes and what color sensors are tuned for. Um, there's actually a whole lot of, of information in the almost infrared spectrum uh, of film that an authentic analog film process would respond to. And the sensor built into a film camera isn't as good as seeing that. So you have to do some extra work to get those things to come across. So we've done that with, uh, the question is what's the film stock? This is um, Kodak Gold 200. So here's another example. This is Film Lab 2.5, and this is Film Lab 3. Film Lab 2.5 ju just tended to struggle with um, certain film stocks and certain colors. This was a particularly bad example. This is Cinestill 800T, which is kind of a hard film to scan. But Film Lab 3 is able to do a much better job with it, and um, the skin tones especially look neutral. One of the things that you would tend to see before um, that you might look for in these samples is that uh, on a skin tone, you'd have kind of a split tone effect with color. So the darker part would be one color, and then the highlights would be skewing another color, and that made it difficult to get good results. Um, there's another one, Film Lab 2.5, the sky and the darker parts of the clouds are blue. Film Lab 3 is much more neutral. One more, that's Film Lab 2.5, that's Film Lab 3. More example I'll do, that's Film Lab 2.5, and that's Film Lab 3. So again, uh, the 
the whites here have like a slightly yellow greenish cast and um here in film lab three it's just much more neutral and you can use that as it is or you can post process that if you want to bring out more saturation um, or more contrast or you know, give it a creative look that you want but it's giving you a starting point that uh, has a lot less flaws and is, is much more neutral. So we actually have some more work to do on that, um, on our image processing engine, but we are releasing it today in beta. I saw a question, someone said, when is it, when is it coming out? And the beta is actually out right now. So if you already have, we haven't put the link up on our website yet, but if you already have Film Lab, what you can do is you can go to the About Film Lab dialog box in your film lab app and check the little box that says you'd like to install betas and you'll see the film lab 3.0 beta will start downloading to your computer um, we're releasing this in beta today because we feel like even though it's not quite complete yet what we have already working is a giant step forward in terms of color accuracy and speed and we thought that uh, you guys would want access to it so we're making it available to net we're making it available now we're going to continue to develop the beta um, probably over the next month or so. And we're looking for feedback from you, first of all, to hear about how well it runs on your specific computer and graphics card, um, but also just feedback on the results you're getting, feedback on the user interface, uh, feedback on some of the new tools that we've developed that we'll be talking about in a minute, and uh, what other tools you'd like to see. And uh, we're looking forward to, to talking with you guys about that and hearing that, having that conversation. So now let me do one more demo. Um, actually, first before, well, let me do this one first. I'm going to give you one more example image of the difference between Film Lab 2.5 and Film Lab 3. And I'm going to do this one interactively because a lot of the difference that you're going to experience when you use Film Lab 3 is in the actual process of doing your own image conversion. When you go to color balance, it just feels like so much of a less of a struggle now than it was before to get good results. It comes much more naturally. So um, this is a sample image that I picked because it always bothered me with Film Lab 2.5. I could never get it to color balance right. I'm running Film Lab 3 here, but I actually can still use the Film Lab 2 engine. So if you've been using Film Lab 2.5 and you upgrade to Film Lab 3, all your images are still going to look the same. They're not going to change out from under you. And the reason is that we're still shipping the Film Lab 2.5 color negative process. Um, and if you like the results you were getting from Film Lab 2.5, it did have a really cool look for some images. So you can continue to use that with your um, existing images if you want to. So in this case, I'm going to try to edit this image. This was on Ektar, which um, was a film stock that tended to give us trouble because of the reds with Film Lab 2. And I'm going to try to color balance this. And what I'm going to run into immediately or pretty quickly here is that I just can't quite get everything right. I can sort of optimize for the skin tones. I can try to optimize for the greenery. I can try to optimize for the white flowers, but there's just like no setting that I can find where everything really looks good. So I'm, I'm having to do some kind of a compromise. So now if I switch to the new color negative process in Film Lab 3, it's pretty much there. The auto settings um, in this case came pretty close to nailing it. I can still make adjustments, but um, as I do, rather than have part of the image be color balanced right and part of the image go out. It's more like the entire image is either wrong or right. And there's just a sweet spot where it looks good. So um, it's such a nice experience editing color in Film Lab 3. I'm going to take a moment and look at a few of the questions. Um, we will get to those in the end. Someone had mentioned already reading the article. I do have a few other demos to do. Um, but before we talk more about, actually, while we're here, let's do, let's do this demo. For the tungsten. What was the question about tungsten? Can you show a comparison where the photo has the tungsten lights? Explain why they vary so much. Um, let me think 
if I have, uh, I'll, I'll get to that one at the end. I've got to think about a demo image. So let me go through a few specific things that I have here. Um, so in addition to the new color processing engine having better color science, it's also made it possible for us to add more, um, more features and more algorithms to, to Film Lab. And there's a few things we've done that we think are going to be really useful for a lot of people who are scanning film. So um, actually, I can do it right back on this image. One of the, the things that we've added is um, scanning flare correction. So um, when you do your, your film scanning, depending on the room that you're in, if you might be in a, a room with perfectly isolated light where the room is completely black, maybe you have a nice mask around your film scanning device, and you've made sure that there's no extra light bouncing around. But um, a lot of people are scanning in less than optimum conditions. So the room you're in might not be perfectly black, or there might be a little bit of extra light um, coming through. On the sides of your film, if you're doing full border scanning with sprocket holes on 35 millimeter film, there's, pro there's almost no way to completely eliminate flare. So what happens there is you have a little bit of extra light bouncing around on top of your film. Um, that's bright white light. And when that image of a negative gets converted to a positive, all that extra light on the negative side becomes extra darkness on your, your positive image. So the effect is sort of like someone took a pencil and just drew a very light layer of charcoal on top of your whole image. There's just a little bit of neutral density there that's taking away some of the contrast and brightness. Um, so with FilmLab 3, we've added a scanning flare correction tool. And what you can do here, you can see as I'm moving the slider, is just set this based on the conditions that you're in. So most of the time, I think we have a default of 0.75%, which assumes that you're scanning under pretty good light conditions in a dark room. But if you know there was extra light and you feel like you can see in the image that there's that lack of contrast, you can just increase the flare correction. And what it does is um, just sort of brings back the original contrast and color pop of your image. And I have another example here that really shows that. This one is of a fairly light colored subject. So I can do a little bit of color balancing to get this looking the way that I want here. And then if I go down to the flare correction tool, I scanned this image myself. And um, I know I did it in a, in a room that wasn't totally dark. It was the middle of the day. I didn't have access to blackout shades or anything like that. So I just scanned with the setup that I had. So there's actually a lot of flare coming into this image. And when I use the flare correction, you can see it really pulls out a lot. Um, I'll zoom in on the, the brightest area. And that's where it makes the most difference. See that? that there's just a level of dullness there that the scanning flare correction cleans up. Another thing that we have in Film Lab um, 3 that is a big improvement is noise removal. So in Film Lab 2.5, we didn't do any denoising or sharpening. We just took the, or the original raw file that you had and um, used that as our input. In the real world, some denoising and sharpening is a good thing. And um, that might be something that we tend to shy away from as photographers who are looking for more of an analog look because we don't want our images to look overly digital. We don't want that watercolor look of too much sharpening, uh, of too much denoising, and we don't want that over sharpened look. But um, if you actually look at lab scans, especially if you're sending your, your film to a consumer grade lab, there's actually a lot of denoising and sharpening that's applied to them. So. Um, you may find that you actually are used to that look, that you like that look. But in any case, sometimes you're dealing with an input image. Um, and in most cases, you're, you're probably dealing with some level of noise and lack of sharpness. And that's just kind of the way that digital sensors work. If you're using a camera to scan film, there's going to be some noise. Uh, and there's going to be a little bit of sharpening that's needed just to make it look right. So in this case, I picked an example that is intentionally um, really bad. This was just a picture taken of a negative as a raw file with an iPhone. And if you've ever looked at an unprocessed raw file out of a mobile device, they have a lot of noise in them. So if I zoom in here, 
you can see there's just a whole lot of digital noise. And a couple things happen with negatives that make noise worse. One is that when you go from a negative to a positive, you're increasing the contrast. That's how the process was designed to work of negative film. So that tends to boost noise. And then the other thing is you're going from a negative to a positive. So there's in a digital image, the most noise is going to be in the darkest parts of the image. When you convert it to a positive, now you have the most noise in the brightest parts of your image and it looks really bad. So that's what we see here with the, the clouds and sky. So just a little bit of noise removal um, really goes a long way into cleaning up this image. And then I can also apply sharpening um, and get uh, a much better looking result. Just to give you an example, that's with denoising and sharpening, and that's what our, our starting point was. So that's going to be a, a big improvement to uh, a lot of our scans to have that built in. And then one feature that I'm really happy to have in this release, or at least to have the start of in this release, is um, being able to separately control the highlights and shadows. So the way that the film process was designed to work in both black and white and color is that your capture medium, your film, has a very high dynamic range. It can, it can record a pretty large variety of light and shadow. But you wouldn't want to usually print all that dynamic range on every photo because you want your output to be contrasty and punchy and it would look really flat if you just compress that dynamic range down. So the way the process was designed is the output photo is designed to have um, more contrast and less dynamic range than the input. And if there were areas where as a photographer you wanted to bring out more detail from the negative, you could do that by dodging and burning. So if your highlights were overexposed, you could burn them in and bring back some of the density there so it wasn't just pure white. If um, your, your shadows had shadow detail that you were missing, you could dodge them, you could reduce the exposure during your print, and that would pull some of the detail back out. And you can see this in Film Lab. Um, you might have noticed this even if you're using the existing version of Film Lab, is that a lot of times what would happen is you move the, the exposure slider or the density slider, is that you'd see that there's a lot of detail in this image here. If I set my density to be low, I can see a lot of detail in the boats and the background. As I increase it, I can pull detail all the way out into the middle of this image and see the sunset, and I can even see a little hair that got on my film because I didn't clean my negative properly before scanning it. Um, the problem was that you couldn't get all this information in the print at once. And if you're sending your photos to a lab, there's a lab technician who's sitting at the scanner and processing um, each of your prints, each of your scans as it comes through, and he's making decisions for you about how he thinks the image should be exposed, he or she. And hopefully the results that your lab tech chose is the same results as you want. If there isn't, there isn't much you could do about it because you just got a JPEG. But one of the nice things about doing your own film scanning is that you can control for this. So in Film Up 3, we've added a highlight recovery tool, which basically burns in the highlights. So I can pick the exposure on my image based on the overall exposure and how I want it to look. And then I can just grab the highlight rec recovery slider and that increases the, the density of the highlight areas and brings it back. So I'll show that one more time. Right now I'm losing part of my sunset. You probably dealt with this yourself. If you're taking photos that include a lot of sky or a lot of sunset, it's hard to get everything into the photo. Highlight recovery just lets me pull that right back in. So that's something I think is going to be very satisfying to a lot of us. If you've ever had, if you've struggled with converting an image because your highlights are blown out, you can't quite find the right exposure setting, that gives you um, the ability to change that. And we've already had some requests for people to do, um, have a control over, over shadows and, and be able to pull detail out of the shadows, um, and even to do masking for dodging and burning. And we will be implementing those features in the future, but this is a great start for the, the first beta release. Another improvement that I want to talk about today is black and white. And we haven't forgotten uh, black and white conversion. And we've also done an entirely new implementation of our black and white process for Film Lab 3. Uh, I picked this image because it illustrates a problem that 
could come up when doing conversions in FilmLab 2.5. So once again, um, in film, the FilmLab 2 black and white negative engine is still there. You can continue to use that process and your, your photos won't change if you were getting results that you were happy with before. Let me just take a moment and crop this down. So this image has some light and shadow in it. There's a lot of, there's some highlights over here and uh, another scan, I apologize. Next time I'll clean my negatives a little better when I'm doing a demo. And you can see the information is all there on the negative. There's information in the highlights, there's information in the shadows. The challenge is getting that all into my picture at the same time. So in FilmLab 2, you could adjust contrast and that would almost get me my shadow detail back. But I still kind of have a position where um, I need to make the shadows too dark in order to see detail in the in the highlights, or if I set the overall exposure where I want, those highlights are getting blown out. Um, so FilmLab 3 fixes that in two ways. One is we have a much wider and more usable range of contrast curves. You can see I can go all the way from very low contrast to very high contrast. And that tool can be used for creative control. Sometimes you want a lot of contrast, sometimes you don't. But really, the purpose of it is primarily to compensate for differences in contrast in your negative. So depending on the lighting conditions when you expose your negative, depending on the film stock you're using, depending if you pulled or pushed it when you developed it, there can be a wide range of contrast on your black and white negative. And FilmLab um, 3 lets you uh, compensate for that. And actually, these the contrast values that we have here between negative 1 and plus 5 uh, are actually all based on black and white paper. So uh, if you're doing variable contrasts, black and white printing in the dark room, the, the range of contrast goes from zero, zero to zero and up to five. And we've used those same contrast curves for um, implementing the black and white process in FilmLab 3. Um, and as a side point on that, the approach that we take in FilmLab is we're trying to faithfully recreate analog media. So um, we look at lab scans for comparison. Uh, we might look at what other apps do for conversions for comparison, but what we view as the standard we're trying to match is analog materials. So um, where we, we can, we actually get some of our negatives printed on film materials so we can visually look at them. Uh, we look at the specs of analog materials and the documented ways that they behave. And um, everything in FilmLab is based on that. So the idea is that when you use FilmLab, although it's a digital process, you're getting results that look as faithful to an analog process as possible. So if you've used um, if you've used FilmLab to process your black and white negatives, I think you're going to be very happy with the increased amount of creative control you have in FilmLab three. All right, that's enough uh, specific demos, but there's one more demo that I want to do for you, and that has to do with speed. So film lab um, 2.5 introduced batch conversion features. So here I've got an entire roll, 36 images um, that I've scanned in with color negative 35 millimeter film. So you'd be looking at something like this if you've done your own camera scanning You've taken your SD card with your scans on it, copied them over into a folder in your computer, and now you're going to convert them over. And in FilmLab, starting in version uh, version 2.5 of FilmLab, you can do a batch conversion like this. I can select all the photos. I can say process as color negative, and then FilmLab will go through and batch process them. So here it goes. It's working its way through. All my images. Oh, I was like, that was really fast. And the reason is that that is actually FilmLab 3, yeah. not, not FilmLab 2.5. Um, I have a copy of it. Hang on a sec. Let me just. Load this up here.
All right, let's check the version. Okay, here's film on 2.5. So let's do that again. We'll revert to the original file. And now I'm going to process color negative and let's, let's just count and see how long it takes to finish processing this whole batch of 36 images. So we'll say one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi. You can see this is taking a while. We'll maybe have 10, 11, 12. It's almost painful to do this in a live demo. 13, 14, 15. So we'll say that took 20 seconds or more to process that roll of film. So now, let's go back to the film up three beta. We'll revert those all back to the original file. And now we're gonna say process as color negative. Here we go. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, done. So it's about four times faster on average. That's typically uh, what we've seen. Um, and we're not even fully done yet with uh, all, the pro all the speed improvements that we have uh, planned for this beta. So the goal is that you really shouldn't ever have to wait around for um, your computer to be working while you're film scanning, which is a big step forward for film scanning in general. We've all spent a lot of time waiting for our, our film scans to complete. And now uh, we work. the goal is to get a pretty much, pretty much instant. So uh, you're going to enjoy that in Film Lab 3. So that's the demo. Um, I'm going to switch back to myself here. Um, so we've got um, a giveaway to talk about, a coupon code to talk about. But first, I just want to, and of course, we're going to answer questions from you. Um, first, I just want to talk for a minute about the future of film scanning. So um, right now, this, the state of things is we've got basically three groups of people scanning film. We have uh, photo labs and we all love photo labs, especially the mom and pop shops that survived the downturn in film and stuck around and we can still bring their film, bring our film there and have it, have it get processed. Um, we have people who are scanning film at home ourselves. Maybe you like to do that. And that's why you're tuning in for this uh, YouTube stream. So you can learn about film scanning software. And then there's actually another whole group of people who are scanning film and that's people who work in cinema. There's uh, film scanning is still alive and well. In, in cinema. Um, there was a lot of talk about film and film scanning in the news with the release of Oppenheimer, which was shot on, on a medium format IMAX film. Um, and right now, all three of these groups are working uh, in totally different ways with totally different technology in terms of hardware and software. And um, where we think the future is going is that there's going to be uh, new better software developed, which we're working on in Film Lab and other people are working on too. And that eventually that software uh, or the, the standards behind that software is going to start being used um, by people who are doing their own, own film scamming and eventually by professional film labs too. And what that will mean for you and me is that when you bring your photo to, uh, when you bring your film to a film lab and they develop it for you, instead of getting back JPEGs that have all the edits baked into them, uh, you'll get back raw files that have the full dynamic range of the film, and it'll be in a format that your film conversion software like Film Lab can understand. And then you can use the images as they are, and they'll look great, and you'll have higher resolution files than ever before. Uh, but you can also go in and make creative edits. You can dodge and burn and do things like that in a way that's not possible with the workflow that most of us have today. And we think part of that change is going to be moving toward uh, standards developed by the cinema industry. So part of what we've done with Film Lab 3 is as our, as our, um, as your negative gets digitized and then it moves from a camera raw file to the output image that you're seeing on the screen, it goes through an intermediary stage, which is a format called ACES, which was developed by the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. 
and is used in cinema. So there's already been some work with some uh, small photo labs starting to play around with using cinema scanners, which are um, very expensive, but so are the old scanners that, that typical um, photogra photographic film labs are using um, and delivering those files to people. The problem is when you get those files today, it's not really in a format that you can do anything with. And you're kind of back to the situation of like going into Photoshop and playing with curves and trying to get good results. So um, as we move forward with our image processing technology in Film Lab, we're going to be able to support those files so that if someone is using cinema equipment for scanning, uh, you can still get results that are faithful to how they should have looked on analog film using Film Lab. All right, that's um, that's where we are and that's where we're going. A couple other things before I answer questions is one, we have a giveaway. Um, let me switch back here. Our friends at Negative Supply have chipped in with an awesome giveaway. They have their brand new 97 CRI 4x5 light, which just came out. This is a great light source for scanning film. If you're into film photography, um, you probably eventually will start using other formats besides 35 millimeter. Um, this one will support up to a four by five. So you can start scanning your 35 millimeter film. Later, you can scan medium format, or if you're already shooting medium format, and then if you're shooting four by five, or if you get into four by five someday, this light source supports it. Um, it's great to see. I think the price point for that is $150, which is very reasonable for a good bright light. Um, made in Los Angeles using high quality materials. Um, it's a good product. I, I recommend it and we're going to give that away. And we also have the new negative supply. Um, what do we call this film, film transport, film carrier. Thank you. The basic film carrier. Um, they were kind of the first ones to make a really high quality, uh, modern film carrier where it keeps your film perfectly flat as you're scanning. Uh, which is a very important thing. It makes it easy to, to move it back and forth when you're doing a whole roll of scans. So our giveaway is the light source combined with the carrier. And how do people how do people enter the giveaway? The way to enter the giveaway, we decided it was a little convoluted because I didn't we're new to YouTube and I didn't understand uh, that you can't see all your followers unless they have uh, toggled into that. So um, if you can go to our last. Uh, post on Instagram where we talk about announce the giveaway and just leave a comment and say that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you are entered in the giveaway. And we're going to draw a winner tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time so that people have the time to have time to find this and enter the giveaway. Okay, great. So hopefully you can all hear Hannah on the mic. Um, as a takeaway, the giveaway is for our YouTube subscribers, but uh, we said that naively, not knowing that we couldn't see all our YouTube subscribers. So there's basically two ways to enter. You can, if you have a public YouTube profile and you're using your name, you can uh, follow us on YouTube and we'll be able to see that. Otherwise, just leave us a comment on our Instagram. And it's basically the honor system. We trust you. If you say you followed us on YouTube, you'll be entered into the giveaway. And we will pick one tomorrow morning and uh, get in touch with you. So that'll be nice scanning setup for somebody. We also have a coupon um, for Film Lab. Did so you actually set it up? It is set up. Okay. So the Film Lab is YouTube 20. Let me, um, I can put this on the screen here. Yes, we'll put it in the show notes. We can add it. We'll add it to the show notes. We'll add it to the show notes. There it is on screen. Uh, YouTube 20, that gives you 20% off a Film Lab purchase, whether it's a monthly purchase, annual, or lifetime. Um, and this is a pretty sweet coupon because it's a permanent one. So if you use it for your monthly subscription, it's not just 20% off your first month, but you'll get 20% off for as long as you remain a subscriber. One thing I'm going to take the opportunity to pitch to you guys is the Film Lab lifetime license. So we have a lifetime license. It's $200. Um, under normal conditions, it's equivalent to about two years of subscribing. So what a lifetime license gives you is access to the current version and every update we ever release to Film Lab in the future, and it's all included um, in that one-time purchase. So if you're going to be using this in the long term, it definitely pays for itself. Um, with a coupon code of 20% off, that takes it down to 160 
So it pays off even faster. And um, it's helpful to us because we're a small company in the early stages and um, having cash on hand lets us move faster, develop our software faster. Um, so it's nice for us when people buy lifetime licenses, it's also a good deal for you. We've already had people leaving comments as we announced FilmLab 3 saying things like, oh, I bought a lifetime license four years ago and I'm so glad I did because now I'm getting all these updates for free. So we definitely don't plan on stopping with FilmLab 3. We have a, a pretty extensive roadmap in the future. We have some great updates coming. So if you buy a lifetime license, you'll, you'll get all those for free in the future. That's my pitch on that. And that's standalone. They don't need anything else. Yes, and FilmLab is, is standalone. Um, a word on our betas. Um, so we have Windows and Mac betas out today. The iOS beta will be out next month. And then the long awaited Android beta of FilmLab 3 will be out uh, later in the fall. We are working on the Android app. It's not quite ready yet, but we're going to have it up for beta testing before the end of the year. And we're really excited to get that um, into your hands. Okay, let's go to Q&A. Okay, I'll just read them to you. Thank you. Because they're kind of in in the tab and in the chat, so I'll go to the tab first. And I know there was a number of people asking about black and white, but you did address that in your presentation. Um, but we can see. So somebody asked, do you have a plan to bring Kodachrome color science into film scanning? Kodachrome color science. Um... That is a really good question. Um, so of course, the tragedy of Kodachrome is that the, the process of developing those um, that film doesn't exist anymore. So Kodachrome was a slide, a positive format. You'd shoot slides with it. And um, you used to be able to send it to a film lab and you get back beautiful slides. And now that doesn't exist anymore. So. Uh, at the moment, of course, we don't have any solution to that problem. But if you already have Kodachrome slides, I guess what you're probably asking about is scanning those and getting good results. And the answer to that question is yes. Um, we do plan on supporting slide film stocks in the future. So um, there's a little bit of a similar problem to film there where slide film was meant to be displayed under certain conditions. Uh, of course, it was meant to be viewed directly by uh, human eyes, so there is a difference there, but it was meant to have certain light sources and certain room conditions and things like that to give good results. So um, if you just scan a slide directly, it's going to look really blue and it's going to have kind of weird contrast and the colors might not be exactly right. And we do plan on um, having a built-in process in Film Lab to get accurate results digitizing slides. Okay. Hopefully that, that answers the question. Next question is, will you support Lumix Panasonic cameras? Yes, um, we do already, um, but we don't have a special profile for them. So I think if you just use the standard prof color profile in FilmLab 3, you're going to be happy with the results that you get. Um, but there's still improvements that are possible. Um, and I would say we're probably like 80 or 90% of the way we want to be there in general with our color science, but there's still areas that we can get even more accurate. And ultimately the way to do that requires that we have the spectral sensitivity of the specific sensor on each camera that we support. So, um, we need to know exactly how that camera responds to light and every camera and sensor is different and the camera manufacturers do not publish that information. So we have um, a number of cameras that we do have specific profiles for because we've been able to gather them from existing research papers that have been published and other sources online. But ultimately to get where we want to be, um, we're going to have to build a much bigger database of specific spectral sensor characteristics for different cameras. And um, that's a work in progress, and I don't really know exactly how long that's going to take yet. So I would say try FilmLab 3 today. I think you'll probably find that the results it gives you are very good. And um, you can look forward to those results continuing to just get even more fine-tuned and accurate in the future. 
Next question, are dedicated film scanners similarly well supported to digital cameras, for example, cool scan series? Um, it, uh, my answer to that would be actually very similar to with the Panasonic question. Um, we have, we do not yet support specific um, film scanners and we would, we want to, and we, we plan to. So ultimately what we want to have is a profile that understands, we know exactly what's, um, how the sensor in that exact scanner works and we have a profile built for it and we can um, process the input to get the most accurate results. Um, and what that would require is for you to use um, software that gave you a raw file out of your scanner so that we were able to get the raw values exactly what the scanner read when it measured the film and then we could convert those. Um, at the moment, we don't have that. So what you can do is you can scan into a TIFF and have that be in a standard color space like um, sRGB or Adobe RGB. Um, in that case, when we get information like that that's already been processed into a new color space, we call that being output processed instead or output referred instead of input referred. So we're not getting the actual input, but we're getting what the scanner created for output. Um, the results tend to be a little bit less accurate because there's been a little bit of interpretation done by the scanner. Um, but for any of these, these questions, I would say um, try it. You can download FilmLab as a beta and you can process your first 36 images for free. Um, that's also been that 36 image counter is reset with FilmLab 3. So if you've hit that limit trying one of our previous versions, you can download FilmLab 3 and, and start again. And if you find an image that you don't think you're getting good quality with, um, please get in touch with us. Our support email address is support at uh, developandfix.com or support at filmliveapp.com. They both go to the same place. We can put that in the show notes. And um, what we'll do is we'll send you a Dropbox link so you can upload your input file to us. And then we'll put that in our set of images that, um, that we know need to be improved. And we'll work on improving that for the next version. Next question, is a clone tool for removing dust a possibility? Yes, as you've seen in my demo, uh, <laughs> dust is a real problem. So we I feel your pain. Um, that is a possibility, and that probably won't be in, or I can tell you that that is not going to be in the Film Lab 3.0 release, but 3.0 is just the beginning. There's going to be, you know, 3.1 and 3.2. And um, we really try to listen to our users as far as what we prioritize. So if we, if what we hear from you guys is we're happy with the color science, um, what's really causing us the most pain now is the lack of a dust removal tool. We'll definitely prioritize doing that next. Next question. Is there any chance of the integration of a tethered process? Yes. Um, that is a long-term goal. Um, we have built the groundwork to that because we support film scanning on mobile. And that's basically doing an in-device tethered process where we're getting live a live feed from a live video feed from the camera, and then you press capture and it captures, and we get the raw file, and then we process it into Film Lab. Um, so the challenge there, as you can imagine, is that there's a lot of different camera manufacturers, and there is not really a consistent standard that they that they all support. And some of them, like Sony, have been really bad about like every new generation of cameras. They don't support the old one that they use, and they have a new. API or they drop the API. So um, that is a solvable problem. It's definitely the technology is out there to do tethered scanning. And we would like to do that, but it's gonna, it's gonna, um, it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take some time. So I can't give you a time on when that will happen, but it's definitely part of our future roadmap and vision for Film Lab. This is kind of an interesting question. One of you is a dentist. <laughs> And you, it sounds like you use, uh, do photography on as a hobby and, and use Film Lab in that way. But he's asking, can Film Lab work for black and white film x rays? It would be great in my oral surgery office. Wow. That is a great question. I would love to talk to you more about that. Um, I don't see why not. If it's possible to give us some digital samples of those input files without violating patient confidentiality. 
Um, if you could get in touch with us directly and we could work out how to get some sample files from you and um, we can test it out. Or again, you're welcome to download the FilmLab beta and try it out yourself and let us know. Great. Um, let's see. Now I'm back to the, the live chat, so I'm just having to farm the questions a little bit. Um, so a couple of people asked about black and white, but I do feel like that has been addressed. Um, I've got one here. What do you got? From um, Sear Red Cross Photography. That's Levi. Uh, Le the Boston area, Le far away. Hey, Levi. Levi asks, film often has varying densities, even with a single roll. Does film lab analyze each frame, frame individually? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, yeah, that's the only way we've seen to, to get good results. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to scroll through. Thank you for all your questions. We were kind of thinking like, Worst case, what if nobody shows up and there are no questions and we just kind of have to pretend like there are questions and definitely not an issue. There's plenty of questions. I've got a couple of comments here while you're while you're looking. Uh, Gary W. Taylor says, what's the GPU minimum requirement? Um, basically, anything that can run metal on Mac OS, which is any Mac that was made probably in the last eight years or so. And on Windows, uh, I think anything that can run DirectX 12. Of course, newer GPUs are going to be faster. Um, I'm using a Mac M1 for this demo. Somebody's asking about a Linux version? Yes. Um, we have thought about a Linux version, and we actually have done a lot of the groundwork to make a Linux version possible. but. Um, the reason we haven't shipped a Linux version yet is that we're a little nervous about the overhead of maintaining it going forward if there's only going to be a tiny handful of people using it. So if you want a Linux version, tell us about it. And if we hear from a lot of people um, who do, and if also you can be specific about the format, like the distribution of Linux that you use and the format in which you would want that um, the app delivered to you because there are multiple ways of installing software on Linux. Um, if we hear from a lot of people and it seems like there's something we can do that will address that, we would love to support Linux. Somebody's calling out the fact that you have a Rolly Flex sitting there. <laughs> it just out of, we just didn't want it to be too boring. We wanted to have something this is our prop. other than Ape Space. This is actually a Rolly cord, guys. Oh yeah, he did say that. I'm sorry. We're yeah, he said really we're keeping it real with the rolling cord. All right. Um, yep. Tell me about the dust hole. What else do you see here? A lot of people are happy, so that's nice to hear. Thank you, guys. Is there a chance of Fuji X-Trans interpolation improvement? Yes, um, happy to say that has been fixed. So I think he might. Did you ask us that on Instagram today? Is that? I feel like I recognize his little avatar. There was an issue in Film Lab 2.5 um, and previous versions with X-Trans processing that has been fixed already in Film Lab 3, and we also have a new, even more improved X-Trans processor in the works that will ship a little bit later. Will saved images now include the embedded color profile? They weren't. Yes. Um, I'm saying yes to that question. That's not the answer. Um, not in the current beta, but that feature is in development. So right now we only support, excuse me, we only support sRGB output and we don't actually embed an sRGB profile into our output because pretty much all apps assume sRGB if there's no profile included. Um, but that is on our to-do list for the Film Lab 3 release is supporting um, multiple output color spaces and embedding the data in there. So that is coming. I think that might've been all the questions. If I didn't say your question and you want to type it again, um, I'm get, I feel a little lost in the chat. Um, so yeah. we can take a second if you have any more questions, but thank you for all these questions. And it's really nice to see 
some old friends of Film Lab on here and also lots of new friends. Yes. Um, one more question from John W. Can you output a RAW file or a format that allows more manipulation in Lightroom or other RAW editors? Um, today, the best way to do that, and for, for Film Lab 3 in the next couple months, um, the best way to do that is going to be to um, choose an output format like Adobe RGB once we support that color space. Process your image in a way intentionally where you're um, preserving as much information as possible, which usually means doing a low, low contrast conversion. Um, and then you can take that information into your workflow and, and process it next. Um, the idea of a, of a raw file format that's a positive, but that includes all the information on film is something that we're super interested in and we're actively working on and we're looking to cinema standards for that. So um, that, that day is gonna come where basically you can output a file from Film Lab that's been converted into a positive, but literally has all the information that was on the negative um, and hasn't done any processing to it in a format that you can then use with other apps. But that's probably post, it's after Film Lab 3.0 that that will actually ship. You see that one from Mark? Uh, Mark Taylor. Yes. Um, well, he asked, will the iOS version be the same as the desktop ones and support raw input from DSLRs? Yes. Um, it's really nice using an iPad, for example, to process your film scans. And um, next week when the iOS beta is out, you'll be able to download that using Apple's Test Flight app. Um, we'll send out an email to our mailing list with the, the details about how to sign up for that. Um, and then you can enjoy processing your film scans on your, your phone or iPad. So I would just say too, as you guys are using Film Lab 3, feel free to send us either the, the fastest way to get in touch with us, honestly, I think it's Instagram Messenger, um, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, basically like texting right there. Um, feel free to share your results with us because we would love to see them. And if it's something that you don't mind us sharing, um, with our audience, we would love that as well. Um, we try to come up with our own content as much as we can, but this is it. This is the whole team right here. So if there's people that can supply us with imagery that we can share, um, and we can give you credit, then that would really help us out. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for bearing with us through our technical difficulties and sticking around and asking questions. Um, this was really fun. I hope you found it helpful and we'll do it again. So see you next time. Thank you.